I'm just taking the back end of your uh, published bio, talking about Fellow of the Royal Society of Biology 2012, uh, Weldon Memorial Prize 2013, uh, Embo um, uh, Excellence Prize 2014, Academia Europa 2015. Thankfully, you haven't updated since 2016. Uh, <laughs> 2016, uh, Charles Blanche Award for for un unparalleled uh, contribution in brain research and the uh, Glass Brain Award. Uh, really glad to have you among us. Um, and thank you over to you for the physics of sentience. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction and, and your kind comments. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and it, it does feel like a very warm community. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then hopefully that will set us all up. So let me repeat my, um, my thanks uh, for being here. I'm going to start with... Um, as usual with this talk, an apology, but a very specific apology now. I don't have a foundational training in cybernetics, um, but I have, over the course of the work, um, largely inspired by neuroscience, but appealing to physics during my oh, career. God. It has become very clear that cybernetics um, and the kind of work that I've been engaged with have very intimate relationships um, and probably share uh, certain foundations along with things like perceptual control theory. So, um, but I repeat, I do not have a foundational training um, in these disciplines. So what I've got to offer in the first hour of this session um, is really a view of self-organization and sentient behavior from through the lens of a physicist and neuroscientist in the fond hope that you will be able to join the dots and see how it can be translated in terms of uh, you know, the, the basic principles which, with which you will be much more familiar. Um, so I'm going to divide the talk into uh, three parts. First of all, um, telling a story about behavior, about um, self-organization from the point of view of statistical physics and information theory, um, with a special focus on Markov blankets and how Markov blankets individuate things that possess attributes such as behavior um, and trying to understand those attributes in terms of something that we'll refer to as a Bayesian mechanics. Um, and then I'm gonna tell the, exactly the same story, but using the concepts and the constructs that come from neuroscience and neurobiology. So how would these um, physics-like principles be applied to the brain, uh, to things like you and me, um, or indeed single cells? Uh, and I'm gonna illustrate that in terms of predictive coding and neural networks as a particular instance or application of the physics that we're gonna cover in the first part. And then if we have time, um, I'd like to just um, drill down on the nature of agency within this kind of treatment um, and specifically um, talk about the difference between mere reflexive behaviors of the kind you might say find in a, in a thermostat um, and the sort of planning um, and deliberate behavior and agency that we find in things like uh, things like ourselves um and i would you know uh, i'm looking forward to a conversation about whether that bright line is necessary and how it does relate to um um cybernetics so i'm going to start with um, a question posed by schrodinger how can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism be accounted for by physics and chemistry I'm not going to answer that question, and clearly we can't do that. Um, but what we can do is just um, highlight the notion of a spatial boundary as being requisite to be able to talk about anything in the sense that to talk about some entity, some particle, some person or something, you need to be able to individuate it from everything else in the universe. So I'm going to read that thing as a statistical object or the boundary that defines, is definitive of that thing as a statistical boundary, um, specifically a Markov blanket. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Markov blanket um, notion, it's a very ubiquitous construct in 
uh, statistics and in causal inference, um, but plays a foundational role in what I'm about to say. I repeat simply because it is the device that allows you to separate or individuate um, the internal states and the blanket states of something from everything else. So more specifically, I've, I've just tried to cartoon the intuition here in terms of a very simple little universe where these blue circles represent some abstract states of the universe and the arrows denote an influence of one state on another state. And if I were to pick um, a particular set of states and to say my states, then we'll call my these states internal states or states that are internal to me. The Markov blanket is defined in terms of the parents, the children, and the parents of the children of the internal states. And the role of the Markov blanket is to provide a kind of insulation, a kind of separation between the internal states and the remaining states, the external states here. So technically what this means is that if I wanted to predict the dynamics or evolution of my internal states, given the rest of the universe, I would only need to know the Markov blanket, all the information about the entire universe that is pertinent to, me, to my internal states is contained upon this boundary or this, mark, uh, or this uh, Markov blanket. Um, mathematically, that just means that the internal states are conditionally independent of the external states, given the blanket states. So that's my definition of thingness. Um, uh, and I'm going to make a further move here. I'm going to um, make a bipartition of the blanket states into sensory states and active states, uh, according to the very simple rule that the, um, the sensory states influence but are not influenced by the internal states. And similarly, the active states influence, but are not influenced by the external states. Um, so I've now effectively got a partition of all the states in the universe, or this particular little universe, um, that enables me to identify a particle or some entity that comprises the internal states and the blanket states that themselves can be divided into active and sensory states. And you may be asking, why have I done this? Well, it it organizes a way of thinking about all the kinds of systems that we um, as scientists and philosophers like to think about. Two of my favorite systems are here, uh, the brain. Um, so under this kind of partition defined by these sparse couplings, um, the arrows, how can we cons uh, consider the brain? Well, the brain would have internal states or my um, your synaptic activities, my connectivity, everything I need to list in order to define the state of the brain at this point in time. And the internal states are going to influence the active states, say my actuators, my autonomic reflexes um, that perform actions on the external states that then change my sensory epithelia, my sensory states that are uh, then going to influence my internal brain states, and so the cycle begins. And exactly the same causal dependency structure or separation or partition of states can be found um, anywhere you look. So, for example, uh, a single cell will have intracellular internal states that are internal to, say, the actin filaments of a cell uh, that are themselves beneath the sensory states that are pushed out into the external states that reciprocate in terms of causal influences uh, by activating cell surface receptors that change the intracellular states that uh, change the action and so forth. On both, uh, both of these examples, you have this notion that the inside is influencing the outside vicariously through the active states, while the outside is influencing the inside, again, vicariously through the sensory states. And this sort of completes a, a, a circular causality that, as a neuroscientist, one could read as a, you know, a very elementary form of an action perception cycle. Um, what I'm going to do now, though, is just to ask you to forget about the Markov blanket. We're going to now rehearse 101 physics um, to the extent that we need to, to pursue the argument. Having established the core physics uh, at hand, 
we're then going to put the Markov blanket back into play and see what special properties emerge. Um, and I'm framing it like that because the, the starting point for this is exactly the same starting point that you would find in all kinds of mechanics, whether it's quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, or classical mechanics. It starts really with uh, an expression of the dynamics of some universe. And I've sketched that out here in terms of, uh, in this instance, a Langevin equation. So the rate of change of some states is just a function of the state uh, plus some random fluctuations omega. And I've cartooned that here um, in terms of two states. Um, uh, and this can be read at many, many different scales. Uh, for example, it could be neuronal oscillations um, in one cell of my brain as they course their trajectory of these two states, this two state state space, space over very fast um, time scales, say appropriate for gamma oscillations. Uh, it could be um, my cardiac cycle, going through the phases of the cardiac cycle. It could be me getting up in the morning, um, having a cup of coffee, doing my emails and working through the day. It could be an annual cycle. The point being here, we are interested in describing systems that have a particular characteristic. In fact, one could say uh, definitional, uh, definitional of them um, being uh, existing in the sense that they possess characteristic states. Um, the characteristic in question is that they always the system always revisits states it was once in um, and this could be read in many ways it could be read as possessing an attracting set or an attracting manifold on which the states evolve um, it can be read as the solution to a, an equilibrium steady state um, and it can also be read um, effectively instead of being tracing out particular trajectories, we can read the density of these trajectories as a probability that you will find me in a particular state if you sampled me at random. And that's the, if you like, the interpretation that I'm going to pursue. So why am I focusing on that interpretation? Well, we know a lot about the dynamics, not of the states in and of themselves, but of the density distribution, the probability distribution over um, those states. And um, some of you may or may not be familiar with various expressions of the density dynamics. I've written it down here in terms of the Fokker Planck equation. So now it's a rate of change, not of the states, but of the probability density over the states that is expressed here in terms of the amplitude of the random fluctuations and the flow. Um, and this equation is again ubiquitous in uh, physics, and um, you, know, you could read it as a, a continuous form of master equation. It could be the time independent Schrodinger equation. Wherever you look, it's a fundamental equation that describes deterministically the evolution of the probability distribution. But I've just said we're interested in describing systems that have a characteristic set of states such that this probability distribution doesn't change with time. And that's the key move here. So I'm basically looking for solutions for these density dynamics that are now characteristic of the dynamics of systems of interest that possess an attracting set. Um, and just by setting this to zero and rearranging it, um, specifically using, uh, in this instance, the Helmholtz decomposition, what I can do is express the dynamics, the flow, the way that I change my states over time purely as a function of the amplitude of these random fluctuations and the gradients of these probabilities, um, strictly speaking, the log probabilities. So and there's also another term here known as a solenoidal component. So this is a, this is the, the equation I want to focus on um, because it's got some really intriguing interpretations. Um, before I sort of get into those interpretations, uh, maybe uh, a good idea just to uh, explain why there are two terms here um, describing these flows on these probability or log probability gradients. Um, one, uh, this decomposition basically uh, is just describing the fact that you can always split the flow into two orthogonal components. Um, the first one, um, say for example, we think about water flowing down a bath, um, the, the plug hole in a bath. 
um, then the gradient flow is flowing down the gradients, whereas the solenoidal flow denoted by Q here circulates on the isoprobability contours or um, um, solenoidal, shows this kind of solenoidal effect as it circulates around. So it's just a way of uh, breaking up the dynamics into a gradient flow um, on the one hand and some circular flow on the other hand. Um, both of those have interesting implications. Um, you know, the gradient flow we're talking about is actually flowing, if you like, up log probability gradients. It's like gathering, uh, flowing up a concentration of the probability of finding me in a particular state, as if the system is trying to gather itself into its uh, attracting set and resisting the dispersive effect of the random fluctuations. The circular flow is interesting as well because it it says that these kinds of systems must have a form of oscillation or cyclical aspect, solenoidal aspect to them. And of course, if you think about biological systems, they're full of biorhythms and oscillations. And indeed, you can almost say life cycles themselves are an articulation or uh, an expression of this kind of um, um, ubiquitous kind of uh, of dynamics. So. That's where we've arrived at. The solution to the density dynamics has to have this functional form, which can be expressed as a gradient flow on these log probabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. What we'll do now is uh, bring the Markov blankets back and see if there is another kind of mechanics that complements or uh, fits in um, the classical or um, 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 statistical and, and quantum mechanics that can be derived from these uh, density dynamics. So that flow equation holds for all the states and the particular partition that we discussed um, under the Markov blanket. So the internal states will be doing uh, a gradient flow on the probability here of the, uh, the Markov blanket states. Uh, as will the active states. And notice by construction, I can drop the external states because the internal states and the active states are not influenced by construction by the external states. So this leads to a slightly simpler form of this um, these gradient flows um, that I'm going to read in terms of perception and action, both in the service or look as if they're in the service of maximizing the log probability um, of states. So what are the, the interpretations of this quantity, this log probability of some sensory states given a Markov blanket or given uh, given me? Um, and I've um, listed a few interpretations here um, just to illustrate um, the again, the importance of this of this uh, fundamental kind of dynamics, this gradient flow. If you recall, this probability scores the likelihood you will find me in these states. They are states that are part of my attracting set. They are literally those states that attract me. And in that sense, then they are states that are valuable for me, given my Markov blanket. Um, and all of these, all that's, that, that this equation is saying is it looks as if my internal states and the way I act upon my world or my external states are trying to maximize by flowing uphill um, this quantity, which can be read now as reinforcement learning. If you're a control theorist, it would be optimal control theory. If you're an economist, you could read this in terms of expected utility theory. And that's nice because the negative um, of this uh, value, um, if you're an information theorist, will be known as the self-information, uh, the implausibility of this sensory observation or outcome or event given me, um, more simply surprise or, or even more simply just the surprise. Um, and from this, we can um, spin out uh, the principle of maximum mutual information or the Infamax principle, equivalently the minimum redundancy principle, and indeed the free energy principle. Um, why the free energy principle? Well, the free energy is just a bound uh, or proxy for this uh, this surprise and I'll unpack the functional form of this later on again trying to give you give an intuition as to how one can interpret the components of uh, the free energy 
equipping it with a, a you know a teleology or a functional interpretation which uh, may or may not be necessary to simulate um, the behaviors of, of, of interest the average of self-information or surprise is just the entropy um, which means that this um, fundamental gradient flow will look as if it's trying to minimize the dispersion or the entropy of the, the blanket states in this example, the sensory states. And of course, that's just an expression of the Holy Grail um, um, physics uh, or the physics of self-organization um, as articulated, say, by Herman Haken's uh, synergetics. And if I was a physiologist, it would just be a statement of homeostasis. It would just be a statement that systems that persist in a physiological sense um, are those that show a generalized homeostasis. They are keeping their essential variables, as it were, within viable bounds that are characteristic of the physiology or the, the kind of thing uh, that this system is. There's a final interpretation that I want to pursue here, which is the, the interpretation that a statistician would bring to the table. Um, so if a statistician saw this expression, she would think, ah, you are now writing down the probability of some sensory observation, some data, some sample uh, from the world or generated by some uh, process or world, uh, given not me or my Markov blanket, but me considered as a model of um, the way in which my sensory observations were generated. And this would be known in statistics as um, um, the model evidence, um, also known as the marginal likelihood um, of these sensory data. And I emphasize the model, of course, because what we're saying here is that um, to be uh, to solicit valuable outcomes and to minimize my surprise and to self-organize in a way that resists the second law, if second law applied to open systems of this sort, is just to be a good model of um, my world. And of course, this is just uh, a statement of the good regulator theorem um, from Ross Ashby and colleagues. Uh, but I'm going to pursue exactly the same notion from the point of view of statistician, um, leading to things like the ba Bayesian brain hypothesis, um, um, also formulated in terms of evidence accumulation, gathering evidence for my model of the world um, and predictive coding, which is the example that I'll show later on that leads to a specific process theory um, that many people in the neurosciences uh, subscribe to in terms of trying to understand the dynamics um, of a brain doing its sense making and prosecuting uh, its actions upon the world. So that's the um, that's the physics part. Um, I'm now going to tell the same story from the point of view as if I was lecturing to um, people in psychology or cognitive neuroscience, um, but it's the same. It's exactly the same, same, same ideas. Um, I think um, nicely illustrated by this um, uh, 16th century oil painter famed for painting still lives, but when viewed from a different perspective, give a very different visual impression. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit and now you see a face, the point he's making here is that you made that face. This is a very active construction, an interpretation, a hypothesis, an explanation, a fantasy that you have used to explain this particular of, uh, set of impressions on the sensory sector of your Markov blanket. Um, so just to unpack that a little bit more, it really speaks to the brain literally as a purveyor of fantasies or uh, literally a fantastic organ that is evincing very much a, a, an inside out kind of um, uh, perspective on perception, which somewhat contra contrasts with early 20th century view of a sort of um, outside in where the brain was um, so particularly say visual hierarchies were thought to extract information uh, from um, the sensory input. This turns that on its head, one of Dan Dennett's strange inversions, and say, no, no, um, it it feels, it, it is a, uh, it is a, um, a, a better way of understanding perception 
um, uh, and sense making is to treat the uh, to treat the problem as an active problem of construction, and the active nature will become even more apparent um, as we get uh, deeper into the notion of active inference. So. This view, um, I, I sort of uh, mentioned 20th century um, sort of outside in perspectives, but in fact, they were predated by, by um, this inside out uh, perspective by uh, people like Herman von Helmholtz, and you could argue right the way back through Kant to Plato, but beautifully summarized here by Helmholtz um, as follows. Objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. So again, he's referring to this notion of uh, imagining something on the inside and then predicting what you would see and then using what you're actually seeing to update, revise your hypothesis uh, until you've got a good account of what's going on. And he referred to this uh, um, in terms of um, unconscious inference or, or a perceptual inference. Very closely related to the notions of Richard Gregory in um, psychology, um, who saw perception as hypothesis testing, again, emphasizing, emphasizing an inactive aspect um, to, um, to our perception, sort of visually palpating the visual scene with our eyes to gather the right kind of evidence to test the hypothesis that this particular um, set of visual inputs uh, was caused by this or that. And these ideas have been taken up in machine learning um, and artificial intelligence research to great effect. Um, for example, people uh, like Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane actually built a Helmholtz machine um, as a, a mathematical metaphor or image of the Bayesian brain, uh, borrowing explicitly from um, Bayesian statistics and the work of Richard Feynman, uh, which is where the free energy comes from. So uh, Feynman, um, if you like, solved the problem of evaluating that marginal likelihood of model evidence, um, which is an intractable problem, by converting it into an optimization problem by producing a bound upon uh, the log marginal likelihood or that self information that we we're talking about earlier on um, in the context of um, QED or quantum electrodynamics. So, putting these two together, they invented the Helmholtz machine. Um, which is formally almost exactly what we would predict from the point of view of this physics understanding of sense making. Um, and we want to now extend the story to include action. So let's come back to this notion, Helmholtz's notion of impressions on the nervous mechanism. So if that Bayesian interpretation of self-organization under a given attracting set that possesses a Markov blanket, what would that mean or how could one describe sense making on the inside, on the internal states? Well, it would look as if me on the inside, I am in receipt of these sensory impressions on my sensory epithelia, my sensory veil, say my retina um, or my skin or my, um, my hearing apparatus. And they would present themselves as shadows um, sparsely sampled impressions upon my sensory veil or my the, the sensory uh, sector of my Markov blanket. And it would look as if my internal dynamics were trying to uh, predict or explain what caused those, um, um, those sensory impressions. Um, so how could we think of that in terms of the internal dynamics? Well, we already know how, uh, uh, how to describe the internal dynamics, say my brain dynamics, my neuronal dynamics, because it must be an instance of one of these um, fundamental flow equations. Um, so I, I'm going to make a couple of moves here. What I'm going to say is, if I can read my internal states as parameterizing some variational or uh, probabilistic representational beliefs, a probability distribution uh, about the external states, then I can interpret this um, um, fundamental gradient flow, which I've now expressed not in terms of the log probabilities, but in terms of the uh, the free energies that stand in for the the uh, self information or the uh, log um, the log values. Um, I can now 
express this in a way that somebody in engineering would would re immediately recognize and they would imagine also people in say perceptual control uh, theory would immediately recognize um, the particular form here i've written down as a kalman filter um or a, you know, a simple form of um um bayesian filtering um where the solenoidal part would be read as the prediction so uh, imagine that the internal states mu now stood in for some expected states of the world so that the mu was now an expectation of some say a gaussian probability distribution which means that if i had some expectation about the state of the world i could predict the rate of change of the state of the world now I don't know whether that's true or not, but I can now use the gradient flow part, the non-solenoidal or the dissipated part of the gradient flow. Um, um, and I can now interpret these gradients of free energy in terms of a prediction error. And I can use that prediction error to update my prediction to give me a um, the best guess about what's going on out there in terms of the external states. So let me make that try and make that um, uh, even more intuitive um, and just ask, well, what is this prediction error? Well, I've just said it mathematically, it's just the gradients of the um, the vari variation free energy or the surprise or the self-information. Um, but intuitively, what is it? Well, imagine I had this sensory impression on my eyes, on my retina, and I had an internal brain state that stood in for a belief that this particular set of sensory impressions was caused by a howling dog. Now, if I had a generative model that could generate what I would see if this hypothesis or expectation was correct, I can then compare the ensuing prediction with the actual sensory impressions to produce a prediction error. And then what this equation is saying is I'm using that prediction error to drive changes in my internal states by neuronal activity say in order to eliminate the prediction error to destroy the free energy gradients to attenuate and resolve the prediction error until i have found the best explanation for this particular uh, pattern in terms of the prediction hence predicted coding um, now notice here that this is just describing self-organization of internal states in relation to external states and um, are communicated via sensory states in terms of minimizing prediction error, you'll never actually know what caused your sensation. So in this particular example, it was actually a dog, uh, sorry, a cat uh, casting the shadow uh, that looked very much, looked much like a dog. But it doesn't matter if I don't know, all I need to do is to keep my prediction errors low for as long as I live and then job done. So that's a very sort of parsimonious and I find uh, a nice way of just describing the imperatives of sense making uh, um, and, and action um, in the sense we can forget about the physics and just reduce it all now to prediction error. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, for those people in perceptual control theory, this, this should uh, be, be a story um, well uh, rehearsed. Um, so. What about this sort of action perception cycle? Well, there are two ways I can minimize prediction error. I can either change my mind literally by changing my neural activity to change the predictions of my sensory input and make them closer to the sensations to resolve the prediction error in the way that we've just described. But there's another way I can do that. I can actively resample my sensorium to make my sensations more like my predictions. And this would be action, changing sensations to make them more like predictions, as opposed to perception, uh, namely changing predictions to make them more like sensations. So heuristically, what this means is that we would expect to see action fulfilling the prophecies or the predictions afforded by perception um, in a very, very simple way. And just to illustrate the simplicity, I'm now going to um, go, um, sort of talk explicitly about predictive coding uh, and particularly hierarchical predictive coding of the sort that people currently in the neurosciences think is a nice way to think about message passing and dynamics amongst different neural populations um, in the brain. Um, so um, what I've done here is... Uh, draw a schematic of the visual system 
um, and in its entirety. So starting off, say, with visual signals from the eye reporting visual input, they come into a, a nucleus and subcortical nucleus called the lateral geniculate uh, nucleus. Um, and these visual inputs are then um, in receipt of top-down predictions. And the difference then is scored by a prediction error that then is sent to drive or update beliefs, expectations represented by units encoding what is being, being predicted to try and eliminate this first order prediction error. In a hierarchical context, though, we can just um, repeat this process. These are now um, first order predictions that themselves are being predicted by second order predictions that are used to compare with the first order predictions to produce a second order prediction error that then is used to drive these higher order predictions and then so on recursively to any uh, hierarchical level desired. So that would be a picture of hierarchical predictive coding or hierarchical message passing or Bayesian belief updating or all words for the same thing that would be consistent with this physics view of self-organization. What about the action? Well, Let's consider another kind of input, the kind of input that um, in neurobiology we would call proprioceptive input. This basically just reports the state of my actuators, the state of my motor plant, might say my muscles. Um, uh, and this would come in, say, to the pontine nuclei in the brain, and it could be in receipt of top-down predictions about um, where I feel my eyes pointing. Um, and I could use the ensuing prediction error to revise my beliefs about where I'm looking. But there's a much simpler way of resolving these proprioceptive prediction errors. I can actually just return them to the external world and cause them to contract my muscles until they're reporting exactly what I predicted. And of course, what I've just described is this a classical reflex arc. Um, sometimes uh, described um, in the 1980s and 90s in terms of the equilibrium point hypothesis. The notion now is that my predictions are now furnishing set points that are reflexively realized in the periphery by using the prediction errors to destroy themselves or the, the, the implicit free energy gradients simply by acting upon the external states. In this instance, the muscles so that I move my eyes so I get a different kind of information. Um, now notice here, this is very much sort of a closed loop thing, um, but it is deeply informed by the predictions that are gathering evidence from all different modalities. So these predictions are realized in a relatively closed form um, setting, but the predictions in and of themselves are uh, inherit from some very deep hierarchical um, sense making, if you like, uh, under this predictive coding view. So that's the uh, that's the basic story. I just want to um, um, end now with with a little bit more of a technical nuance on this free energy um, and just a conceptual proposition um, that would differentiate between the kind of reflexive behaviour that I've just described and the sorts of behaviour that you would um, study in psychology your decision-making under uncertainty, planning to do this um, versus that. Um, and just to sort of set the scene, um, I've just provided another schematic here that summarizes the, gen the generic computational architecture that underwrites this action perception cycle. So the idea is, we've got our Markov blanket, we've got our internal states and our external states. We have the sensory sector here providing the inputs that enable the um, the neural dynamics that are performing gradient flows on the um, on the variational free energy uh, that look as if they are optimizing beliefs, <laughs> maximizing the um, the, um, uh, the the quality of representations or beliefs about the causes of these ex uh, sensory states, the external states here, to form um, a expectations about states of affairs out there beyond sensory, um, beyond my Markov blanket. And then these beliefs are used to generate uh, particular predictions specifically of um, my motor plant or my 
appropriate set the the the, the apparatus that I use to act upon the world um, um, uh, and we can read these in terms of proprioceptive prediction errors that then drive action that changes external states that supply new sensory states and so we have our action perception cycle now characterized or described in terms of perceptual inference and the ensuing action selection that is then driven by the predictions of what the motor plant um, should um, uh, should be registering or reporting um, via proprioception. You can get quite a long way with this um, with this construct um, in terms of producing biomimetic behavior. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, it illustrates a few subtle points. First of all, um, sometimes the structure that you ascribe to the world actually comes from your own head, even though you think you are trying to just um, guess the causes of your own sensations um, under this view or uh, under this description. Um, so what we've done here is equip a, a synthetic agent with a generative model in which the agent thinks that there's some autonomous dynamics, um, in this instance, a heteroclinic cycle that comes from a, a lot of a con, uh, Volterra um, uh, um, uh, attractor um, that just circulates with a, a heteroclinic or, orbit here. Um, and the generative model is configured such that the agent thinks that this abstract movement maps to movement in some extrapersonal Euclidean space and it's pulling an invisible string, uh, spring, my point is, um, that is connected to her finger. So she expects to see and feel a finger being pulled around in this itinerant orbit. Um, and of course, those expectations now become descending predictions of what she expects to feel and what she expects to see. But because the reflexes are fulfilling the predictions about what she expects to feel, her arm will actually, or finger will actually move, thereby generating the visual impressions that she predicted and satisfying those predictions. And what that looks like from the outside is that the agent is uh, doing a very elemental kind of handwriting, generating the sensations that were predicted in both the proprioceptive and the, uh, the visual domain. So just to summarize that, we have these top-down predictions in the proprioceptive domain generating action uh, and what could be called corollary discharge um, um, generating visual predictions that are then fulfilled by self-authoring um, the causes of sensations through actually acting and generating what I expected to see. Um, one nice thing about this is we can actually suppress the proprioceptive prediction error so that there's no information that this agent um, has available to it um, that would suggest that she or it is actually moving, um, uh, which would be a little bit like um, seeing stuff that's caused by somebody else, and then uh, the, and by implementing this um, this adjustment, we can now um, simulate action observation, observing somebody else act, uh, uh, and compare it to the simulated neural dynamics during action itself. But from the point of view of the agent, very little has changed. She's still got all the machinery to predict this kind of visual input, um, so can use exactly the same um, predictive generative model, generating the predictions, the same neuronal dynamics to actually explain the visual input. And indeed, if one looks at the activity um, of the simulated neuronal responses, one can reproduce things you find in neurobiology, like place field activity. But crucially, the same pattern of selective responses are listed during action and the observation of another performing the same action. So that's uh, that, that particular illustration, which I repeat is, is, is not um, unbiomimetic, um, rests upon the Markov blanket structure that I described before, uh, here detailed in terms of the dependencies. What I want to do now is just make one very small move that could have a profound effect on the way that one might describe um, uh, deliberative behavior. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the influence of the active states on the internal states. And my motivation for doing this is that if things get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, 
at some point, the internal states will lose the direct connection from the active states. Um, and so I'm going to remove that. And that has a very interesting consequence. It means that from the point of view of the internal states, the active states now become a vicarious cause of the sensory states, which means that it'll look as if the brain is now encoding the internal states are encoding the active states as if there's a distinction between my physical realized actions that I can only infer through the sensory consequences of actions. And I've just car cartooned the fundamental distinction there from the point of view of this Bayesian mechanics or interpretation of internal dynamics in, um, um, in terms of this self-evidencing or Bayesian mechanics or gradient flow on the log model evidence. Um, um, I'm drawing a distinction between these um, the behavior of large particles where the active states um, no longer have direct access to the internal states. Um, and I've drawn that in terms of the you know the presumed beliefs of simple things like cells where they don't have to represent their own action. They, they you know the, the action is directly informing and influencing the internal dynamics. Uh, in contradistinction, things like you and me um, may well be better described as having beliefs about our own action. And that's crucial. And I mean, basically, it's not propositional beliefs here. Um, and that's crucial because that takes us into a different world. It takes us into a world um, of planning and inference where now, because I've got effectively beliefs about what I am doing, I now have to infer what am I doing? If I'm making an inference, I have to have prior beliefs about um, what the kinds of things that I do. And the argument here is, well, what kind of things do I do? Well, I'm a free energy minimizing thing. Therefore, I must uh, more I will more likely commit to those actions that minimize the free energy. I would expect consequent upon that action. And mathematically, that leads to uh, this is near the last slide now, um, a really interesting um, decomposition of um, the terms that constitute these, if you like, generalized prediction errors um, or the free energy bound on, on the log evidence. So forgive the equations, but the reason I put them up is I, I just want to see what happens to various interpretations of this um, free energy functional or function of um, sensory states and active states. Um, when we move into the future, when we now um, appeal to the free energy as a way of evaluating the likelihood of, that I will act in this way or, or that way. Um, so what I've done here is just write out the full expression for the variational free energy. Um, and I've written it in two different ways. This is the kind of expression that somebody from statistics would, would be comfortable with. And they would read this as complexity um, minus accuracy, where the accuracy is just a log probability of some sensory states, given my belief about their causes, the, the external states here. The complexity is interesting. It's effectively a, um, a divergence, um, technically a KL divergence, but can be read just as a difference between two kinds of probabilistic beliefs, namely um, the um, what I believe um, my uh, beliefs about states of the world, um, uh, my, given my exposure um, and the sensory information, namely my posterior beliefs after seeing some uh, data under some action, um, and the prior beliefs. So it's, it's, it really scores the degree to which I change my mind in receipt of my sensory impressions. Um, it's the amount of information gain um, or the cost I have to play, pay in order to um, move my prior beliefs to my posterior beliefs as a result of this updating process driven by these prediction errors. If you're in machine learning, um, you'd rearrange these terms um, so that you would separate the log evidence um, that we've been talking about um, 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 from another KL divergence between 
my approximate posterior beliefs that come from the free energy and the exact posterior beliefs about external states given the sensory states. Um, so this mean because this can be never be less than zero, this free energy is often called an evidence bound um, in machine learning. Um, and sometimes with the acronym ELBO, because they use a negative free energy, E-L-B-O, an evidence lower bound. The reason I take you through that is that if I now say, well, let's take these quantities and ask, what would they look like in the future before I've actually got any sensations? So now let's take um, the probability distribution over the sensations given I'm acting in this way and use them to take the average of these quantities. And what happens is, the, the complexity becomes risk, the accuracy or the inaccuracy becomes ambiguity, and the divergence and the log evidences become intrinsic and extrinsic value respectively. So what are these quantities? What would they look like? How could one interpret these? Well, if we just ignore the prior preferences, the attracting states, the, uh, the log evidence for, for a moment, and assume that I am equally attracted to all states of affairs. What am I left with? I'm left with something called intrinsic value. In robotics, it's also called intrinsic motivation. Um, in the visual search literature, it's called Bayesian surprise. Um, what is it? It's very simple. It's just the degree to which I change my mind about the external states, given my sensory observations under this action, in relation to the same beliefs before without seeing the sensory observations. So this basically scores the information gain or the reduction of uncertainty about the external states. It's, um, if you like, the imperative for exploration. It is sometimes known as a, an epi um, scoring the epistemic affordance of acting in this way as opposed to acting in that way, um, where the epistemic affordance just reflects the amount of information that I will gain if I do this as opposed to that. Um, from the point of view of information theory, it's just um, a uh, the mutual information between the causes of my sensation and the sensory consequences, the external and sensory states respectively. Let me take um, some uncertainty off the table and see what happens. Let's assume that I can see all the sensory states um, and um, therefore the external states become the sensory states and therefore there's no ambiguity. What am I left with? Well, risk. So what is risk? Well, it's just the difference between what I think will happen if I act like this and what a priori I prefer to happen, uh, my attracting external states or indeed uh, sensory states. So. In engineering, this would be known as KL uh, control. In economics, it could be regarded as risk-sensitive control, where we where we, we ignore the ambiguity. And then finally, if I remove all uncertainty, so there's no uh, reducible uncertainty in this environment, I've com become completely familiar with it. Uh, we're just left with the um, the log evidence or the extrinsic value, the expected value, which we started with, which is just scoring the expected. Uh, um, um, log probability of uh, me um, ending up in my attracting set or sensory uh, um, subset of those attracting sets. Uh, so the final example is really just using these equations to simulate another kind of agent that now really thinks about the future and acts in a way, not reflexively to minimize proprioceptive prediction errors, but to minimize the expected free energy or the expected uh, prediction errors in the future by resolving uncertainty. Um, and what we've done here is to simulate a very simple agent um, whose universe just comes along in three flavors. Uh, it, all her sensations are caused by an upright face, a sideways face, or an inverted face. The, the, um, the restriction here is that this agent can only see a very small part of the visual field. So it has to choose very carefully where to look and does so in a way that responds to this epistemic affordance, this intrinsic value or um, expected information gain and chooses the information rich parts of, uh, of, of the image um, shown here in terms of the dynamics and what is actually sampled. And in so doing, resolves uncertainty about the three hypotheses 
um, that best explain the sequentially sampled um, se um, sensorium or visual input, um, showing a progressive reduction in the uncertainty in terms of the Bayesian confidence intervals, um, and correctly believing now that she is sampling from an upright face. So that can be much more succinctly expressed, um, as always, by Helmholtz. Um, and indeed, he has done that here. Each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we've understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us. That is, their existence in definite spatial relations. And so with that, it only remains for me um, to thank those people whose ideas I've been talking about. And of course, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much. Um, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and um, I think we'll, we'll have time for plenty of discussion and questions. Um, if I just start, please, I can see some questions coming in the chat, but if I just start, um, so I think we're going to talk some more about the good uh, regulator theorem, so no need for me to cover that off initially. But let's just maybe explore one point, and please don't um, uh, don't uh, make the mistake of thinking that um, I d I'd maybe all I need here is a repetition of something that you've all already said. But when we decouple the internal states from the active states, um, I'm trying to explore the, the way in which this is reliant on free energy minimization. In other words, this decoupling, if I can, or disconnection, if I can call it that, of the um, uh, internal from the active, in a sense, is happening because of the principle of free energy minimization, or in a sense, is it required by that principle? I, I, <clears throat> that's a really excellent and deep question, and I did not cover it in uh, in this presentation because um, that the answer to that question, um, if correct, has only um, become apparent in the in the past couple few years. Um, uh, prior to much of the preparation of the material and the story that I was telling today. Um, it, it, it has a clear answer. It is not a consequence of the free energy principle. Uh, I think generically speaking, the free energy principle is just a description of things that exist and, you know, um, um, uh, with a careful definition of what you mean by existence, but also a careful definition of um, the particular um, dependencies that underwrite your definition of existence, which is a Markov blanket. So all the free energy principle says is, if you give me <clears throat> a, um, a random dynamical system with a particular sparse coupling that <clears throat> permits the um, existence of a Markov blanket that in turn permits me to identify something as persisting through time, um, then the free energy principle can be applied should you want to. And you may ask, well, why would you want to? Um, for fun sometimes, and literally even have great fun simulating things. Um, scientifically, that, that's, you know, the simulation aspect is very important. Um, you know, um, being able to actually write down the dynamics of a system that you think can be explained by this kind of genetic model or that kind of genetic model is quite useful. It also has applications as an observation model in phenotyping certain behaviors, say in psychiatry. Um, but sorry, back to the question. So notice that the um, the the dynamics do not inherit from the free energy principle. The free energy principle is a description of the dynamics of this kind of thing. So the answer now is. Uh, to your question is, well, what kind of things um, would, um, first of all, show gradient flows that um, are precisely the, the, these paths of least action? And in particular, the kinds of things where there's a disconnect between or a removal of the influence of the active states on the internal states. The answer to the first question is things that are not subject to lots of random fluctuations. So we're talking about big things. Um, things that are certainly bigger than a, you know, a, um, a, a quantum scale in which the random fluctuations average away. And the bigger they get, the fewer the random fluctuations until you actually get right, you get to the, um, 
the you know the scale of heavenly bodies, for example, where there are virtually no random fluctuations, those dissipative gradient flows disappear, and we're just left with the divergence free solenoidal flow, the rotation of the you know heavenly bodies, the you know the the, the yeah. earth around the sun, for example. Um, but en route, as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, there will be um, a substantial portion and an increasing portion proportion of the internal states that can't see the active states of the um, of the um, the Markov blanket. So the the supposition here is, if you are big enough, you may be describable as panning. Which says that there are small things that are unlikely to plan. So, you know, very, in a very simple-minded way, you wouldn't expect this planning as inference to be a feature or necessary to describe the behaviour of a bacterium or a virus, but you might expect it to to apply to a mouse, and you'd certainly expect it to apply to uh, to you and me, um, just because we are bigger. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, so the free energy is a method or a description that can be applied to things, um, and when applied to big things, then 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 you can certainly um, uh, then you would be licensed to incorporate this planning as inference in into into the description or the application of the method. Is, is that the kind of wonderful, very eloquent? Thank you so much, and. Um... Uh, I appreciate that. So, Jonathan, shall we have a look at the chat, please? Yes, sounds good. And um, what we'll do, we'll take a couple of questions from chat and then we'll go to you, David. Um, so a couple of questions in chat. So first one's from Clement Vidal. Um, Clement, do you want to read out the, the question you put in chat or I can do it on your behalf? Happy sure, I can do it. Um, so how many levels of hierarchies of predictions exist in the human brain? And... Do they correspond to the number of brain layers? Um, the, 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 I'm smiling because um, Chris Frith and I make a joke. Y yes, there is a number. It's six, and then and then um, and then somebody asks why six, and said, "Well, because we said so." <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit of a joke, um, but it's also not a joke really, um, because again, it, it comes down to very very simple um, arguments. Um, about the size of the brain and um, just appealing in a very coarse-grained way to um, say the renormalization group. What tends to happen as you move from very low level sensory levels in these hierarchical structures, which you can read literally as deep world models or deep generative models, where the deep just is an expression of the fact you have this hierarchical structure, which I should add, depends upon sparsity of connections and Markov blankets. So you can't define a hierarchy unless uh, other than in, you know, in terms of which connections are not there. And that is an, another instance of a Markov blanket. So each layer is a blank, Markov blanket for, for all the, um, in a centripetal kind of hierarchy, all the internal states um, that are higher than that. So in these deep architectures, what tends to happen is you get um, uh, as characteristic of the renormalization group, you get a slowing of the dynamics. Um, and, that, and that sort of tells you, well, how many times can you slow down dynamics um, in a brain that only lasts for, say, 50 to 100 years? Uh, and it's usually about six. So you start off with the cognitive moment, which is about 250 milliseconds. So you keep on increasing it by an order of magnitude, say, uh, yeah, and there are, there's an upper bound on the number of times you can do that. And suddenly you encroach upon the lifetime, um, the time, you know, the time scale over which this Markov blanket actually exists. So probably six is an upper bound. Um, not to be confused with um, the fact that the, so what I'm talking about here are levels in a, a deep um, world model or generative model that are, are deployed as you move through increasingly higher levels of, of, of your brain. So, so from V1 to V2, from V2 to V4, which is about here, um, about here, to V5, which would be about here. You know, as you get sort of closer to, to, to um, parietal, and uh, frontal regions um the brain itself um it can be um um it can be envisaged like a sort of um like a cabbage that's covered with all, all the all the you know the neuropil um that contains all the um nodes that, that are con uh, connected the gray matter that 
um, sits like a sort of a layer, which is about three to five millimeters thick on top of this cabbage, where the cabbage itself comprises all, all the connections of sparse connectivity um, called the white matter, because the, 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 the myelinated with little fatty uh, wire sheaths. Um, that, that, that cortex itself has a layered structure. So it, it, you, you be careful when you ask somebody like me about layers and levels, because the, the levels we're talking about in terms of abstr uh, generating um, uh, and contextualizing predictions. So as soon as you have this notion of a hierarchical generative model that's generating predictions, and you're saying that the deeper levels um, click over more slowly in universal or clock time, you're basically saying that the deeper level provide a context for fast things at the lower level. And the fast things at the lower level provide a context for even faster things at the level below that. Um, so that 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 um, notion of a layer uh, is really a level in a hierarchical, uh, in a deep hierarchical uh, uh, um, architecture. And that's very distinct from the layers of the cortex. The layers of the cortex are really interesting because um, when one drills down on the biological implementation of that predictive coding scheme that I illustrated with predictions and prediction error being passed around, it looks as if the prediction errors live in the top three layers and the predictions live in the bottom three layers. And you can actually look at the wiring of the brain and try, try to make sense of um, the hierarchical message passing that now has a lamina or layer specificity in the context of cortical layers. Uh, so it can be a bit confusing. But it's a fascinating area to get the you know the computation anatomy implied by um, the sparse coupling and the you know the predictive coding like interpretations. Great, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, go to Chance Mills next, and then to you, David. So Chance, again, do you want me to read out your question, or or, or would you would you like to read it out yourself? Um, I, I think I'm all right with uh, reading it out myself. Thanks. Um, so the American Society for Cybernetics proposes, you know, this uh, move towards ontogenetic resilience in light of the change of environmental factors at an unprecedented pace, uh, loss of biodiversity, changes in uh, weather patterns, things which kind of anchor our identity and connection to the world. So my question is this, in light of the uh, free energy principle, what is the adaptive strategy for dealing with uh, such a situation? Um, that's a, a, you know, a very challenging question. Uh, and one would be tempted to answer that on two levels. First of all, you know, how, um, how would you describe adaptation under the free energy principle? You could also answer it, how would you use the free energy principle to try and uh, ameliorate some of the challenges that are currently facing us in terms of um, um, over-connectivity and runaway uh, dynamics and, uh, and a failure of self-organisation, which is what would be predicted under the, the free energy principle. Perhaps I'll just make that point clear, because I think it's, I feel quite passionately about that. Um, the, everything that I have said in terms of being able to um, describe self-organization to an attracting set, which I think from is just a, a description of self-sustaining systems. So it is a definition of sustainability at the level of, of, um, of uh, certainly of physics, rests upon the sparsity of coupling. Um, it rests upon the connections that are not there. So if you go around globalizing and increasing connectivity, you're destroying Markov blankets. If you destroy Markov blankets, you destroy um, um, self-organization. You know, technically, from a dynamical systems perspective, you're inducing oscillator deaths everywhere. And one could argue that that's what was what we are potentially confronted with at the moment in terms of overconnectivity and a destruction of all the sparse coupling. Um, that preserves those delicate structures that have uh, self-organized them uh, over millennia, uh, organized themselves over millennia. So if you wanted to apply the free energy principle um, to render a particular system, be it an ecosystem, be it a uh, financial market, be it a um, uh, um, meteorological system, if you could intervene on it, um, to improve its resilience, what you are looking at is a way of uh, preventing the destruction of sparse connectivity to, to preclude 
um, uh, over collectivity uh, to, to, to maintain those boundaries and that segregation in the right kind of way. Um, which means, you know, I guess, uh, ideologically um, putting more regulation in place. Uh, it means having very, very clear geopolitical boundaries, you know, Marco Blankets, you know, in, in, a, um, uh, in a sustainable way, uh, um, um, finding mechanisms that would preclude um, uh, breaches of Markov blankets. Um, you know, if I was a um, an oncologist, these breaches would be basically cancer. You know, cells growing beyond their natural boundaries because they've now become um, 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 poor regulators or, or models of their local cellular eco niche. Um, or you could, you know, look at the you know, wars in Ukraine, for example, as a, the equivalent kind of failure of a boundary or Markov blanket at a geopolitical level. Um, so that's how I would apply the free energy. Um, as an academic, uh, how will you describe this? Uh, I think it speaks to something we mentioned before, which is separation of temporal scales. All that I was talking about during the presentation was focusing on um, one temporal scale, which was inferring states of the world, states of affairs out there. But exactly the same um, mechanics applies to um, the parameters of a generative model, which as a neurobiologist would be the brain connectivity, for example, if you're in machine learning, it would be the connection strengths or the weights in, say, a transformer model, um, and also to the structure of um, these, uh, you know, these good models, uh, these, these generative models. Uh, uh, um, uh, by structure, I mean, you know, the number of levels in a hierarchical structure, the number of components, the, um, the particular sparsity structure, that um, endows it with a deep or hierarchical structure. All of these things have to be optimized in relation to the free energy. That takes you into the world of evolution um, um, in, the, in a very simple sense that the free energy in statistics is used to do Bayesian model selection, but you can also read natural selection as nature's way of doing Bayesian model selection, selecting the right phenotype that's a good model of that phenotype's lived world. Um, so. You've got these different different time scales in play. So I think adaptation of the time, the kinds of time scales that your question intimates would have to, I think, appeal both to parametric learning um, and structure learning, um, um, uh, both of which can be expressed as free energy minimizing or evidence maximizing uh, processes um, in, a, in the face of a, of a changing environment. Um, that in turn speaks to interesting differences between inference and learning, where inference is updating your um, your embodied beliefs about states of affairs, hidden latent states in machine learning talk. Um, learning would be basic belief updating the parameters of your world models, and then um, structure learning or selection will be selecting the right kinds of structures. Each one um nested within uh, the other with a separation of time scales so, to, so you know for example i can't make sense of my sensorium um unless i've learned the right kinds of contingencies of, uh, um, um and i can't learn the right kinds of contingencies say neuro, du during neurodevelopment unless i've got the right brain structure so every one of these scales depends upon the you know all the other ones and of course that uh, that also holds in reverse that you know my brain wouldn't ex exist unless I had a, you know a structure and of course I wouldn't have the wiring uh, in order uh, in order to do the message passing to make to do perception uh, so all of these different scales depend uh, depend upon uh, depend upon each other is that the kind of answer you were looking for or yes thank thank you very much professor. David, we'll go to you next, and after David, we'll go to Trevor Hilda. Okay, uh, well, thank you uh, very much for elucidating and giving me a, a far better feel for perception, information processing, and uh, moving towards action. I don't want to pretend to have understood or digested everything that uh, you said um, completely uh, Professor Friston, what I'm interested in is how far you see this form of analysis of moving towards kind of dissolving the 
a sensation uh, body problem, the hard problem, the issue of qualia or um, raw feels is information um, prior to sensation is sensation a concept we have no need of or does it emerge out of processing our processing um so to speak I, I i just wondered if you could sort of help me around this area or whether philosophically you regarded it as a non-question uh -huh. no i i i'm not allowed to regard it as a non-question i have too many philosophy friends but because i don't do philosophy it's it's not a question i can help you with but i can get i can point you to the, the kinds of uh, answers and the literature where people are really focusing on this. Um, uh, but it is a philosophical question. Um, from my point of view, um, the, the, you know, the, the question really reduces to what um, what kinds and specifically what structures um, um, specifically of the generative models would be necessary in order for um, some artifact, natural or otherwise, to be sentient in the way that you're you're, you're implying. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, what what most people end up um, um, end up with is a number of different arguments. You can take the agency argument, um, which I quite like. Yeah. You know, to be uh, to be um, sentient is to be an agent. So it's me actually gathering my data and possibly experiencing my data or, or not. Mm. But before I can experience it, I, I have to be me and therefore I have to be an agent. So immediately you're talking about um, um, how would you define agency in, you know, as a physicist? Um, and if you defined agency of a non-trivial sort as the kind that inherits from um, the... Uh, representing the consequences of my own action. That tells you a number of things immediately. It tells you that certain things, possibly viruses, cannot be sentient in the way that an agent could be. It also tells you that um, things that have sentience, if they are agents, must have a generative model of the future. Um, in the sense that in order for me to predict the consequences of my action, to plan, I have to have a generative model of the future in the sense that the consequences are not yet occurred, which means there's a certain temporal thickness to these world models that you possibly wouldn't find in a virus or a thermostat, but you might find in me. Um, so that might be one bright line between the kinds of things that can be sentient and, uh, well, to have uh, an agentic sent uh, uh, sentience. Um, and then you move on to... Um, other perspectives, um, some perspectives emphasize, as you mentioned, the body. So I'm thinking about the work of people like Anil Seth here and Lisa Feldman Barrett. They they say that, well, to, be, to have minimal selfhood is just the hypothesis that the best explanation for well, this myriad of sensations from my eyes and my body, and my skin, um, the best explanation for it is I am an embodied being and I am me. And all of this um, is the best explanation for what's going on. So now selfhood itself becomes another um, becomes another um, hypothesis, um, which you have to ask, well, why would you have that hypothesis? Well, one advantage of having that hypothesis, once you realize I am me, um, is that you can now exert mental action over um, which things you attend to. There's quite a long story here, but I'm just slipping in the key words that that some people think that it's not any agency that makes you sentient. It's a particular kind of agency that's on the inside. It's basically attending to different sectors of your Markov blankets um, that basically allows you to select what information you are going to use to do your updating about myself. And my plans. So there are people, um, usually German philosophers, who, who would focus on on mental action as necessary for uh, for that kind kind of sentience and and, and minimal selfhood. And then you get into um, even even more um, contentious issues about um, um, self awareness and having models of me in different states of mind. You know, is the hypothesis that I am a person and I am anxious. Um, is that part of my generative model? And what would that look like in terms of James Langian 
um, sort of formulations of, of your of, of emotions and their bodily expressions. So really fascinating answers, a question, uh, and lots of fascinating answers, but, you, but there are lots of them. So yeah, I think you just have to take your pick from, from your favourite philosopher. I think that's the... Yeah, yeah. That's the... so will turning an artificially intelligent system off ever be morally equivalent to knocking somebody out? Yeah, I, um, if you if you could engineer such such a um, a sentiment, yes, I think so. I, I mean, that's a little bit. Um, I don't like knocking people out because that's usually has more as a neuro as a psychiatrist and neurologist. Is it? That's, you shouldn't really do that if you can avoid it. But it's certainly like putting somebody to sleep or anesthetizing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it would be it would be very much like that. The argument now is: Will you ever get? Um, um, a biomimetic intelligence um uh, you know in an artifact I, I don't see why not provided that artifact is embodied so that you know you're given the opportunity to learn oh i am embodied and i am a thing um and i can plan um and yes in principle yeah it would it would be like switching you, you switching you off when you went to sleep for example yeah, yeah. you to sleep. Yeah, so. thank you thank you um Trevor, do you want to go next and then after Treasure? Yeah, we'll go thank you. Pizza. Thanks very much. Th thanks, Professor Friston. Um, I wonder if you could comment on the Thousand Brains theory about how the neocortex works? Yes, I can. Yeah, so Jeff um, um, uh, um, Hawkins, the, the inventor of the Palm, palm ply, Pilot, and for those of you who, who can remember the, the Palm Pilot. Uh, so um, there are lots of similarities, but some key differences between the kind of um, canonical microcircuits that are, that are um, on offer to, if you like, um, explain one instance of predictive coding. The similarities um, inherit from the sort of uh, a common interest in trying to get a biomimetic formulation of um, sense making and action. So, in fact, Jeff Hawkins hosted uh, a meeting. It must be thirty years ago now, when I was a young man, where you know we started talking about these things. Shortly afterwards, he worked with a gentleman called Dileep George, who's still doing quite um, exciting work. I think at Numenta. Together, they came up with something called the hierarchical temporal model, the HTM, and that shares exactly the same fundamental characteristics that we we're talking about before in terms of the, um, the separation of temporal scales as you move deeper and deeper into generative models. So there's a, you know, there's a shared commitment, um, you know, not just to generative modeling as a, view, a constructive view of sense making and, and action and mnemonics. Um, uh, but th th that also extends into the very, very specific architectures that speak to a separation of temporal skills, um, which was celebrated in Jeff's early work. The Thousand Brains one um, does, uh, you know, it's gone off in its own particular direction. And I think that, you know, the connection here would be more like um, a mixture of experts' perspective on generative models. So I think a very plausible uh, notion that um, you could have um, a whole bunch of generative models all competing to explain the lowest level of a sensory hierarchy. Um, and each one will be fit for purpose for a different context. And one way that they can, if you like, resolve, uh, infer the particular context in which they're operating is to compete to see who can explain the sensory input the, the most. So in statistics, this is called Bayesian model averaging. Uh, where you weight the predictions of each model in proportion to the free energy or the evidence, log evidence, sorry, the evidence for each model. And I think what Jeff has in mind, from my point of view, would be there's, you know, there are millions of these little mixtures of experts and they're all competing. So I think it fits very comfortably with the overall free energy principle, probably less comfortably with um, predictive coding of the of, with, with specific architectures that will be informed by neurobiology, um, you know, the, the thousand brains formulation is is not is not quite um, doesn't have quite the same commitments uh, as the normal canonical microcircuit formulation of predictive coding, uh, and the empirical evidence speaks 
to the canonical microcircuit formulation just because the canonical microcircuit formulation was designed to account for the empirical evidence, whereas Jeff didn't have to worry about that because he, he, you know, he's just trying to find the right architectures. But a lot of shared commitments, some differences, some nuances, and I, I'd be interested to see what it comes up with in the next 10 years. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Margaret Heath next. Margaret, I see you've got a couple of questions in there. So if you want to cover both of those, that would be brilliant. Sure, thanks. Hello. Yeah, thank you, Professor Fiston. Um, thank you for all your work. It's really, it's, it's yummy. <laughs> um, I have a question that is on, on two levels, really. Um, the one is uh, to do, you've discussed in other lectures, um, this notion of temporal death and counterfactual breadth. And typically, theories of the imaginary or the imagination think of this as, as disconnected from sensory information or the external and something that happens internal to the organism. Curiously, I'm quite interested in Andy's extended mind stuff and the distributed cognition, collective cognition, where you'd have ensembles of agents doing stuff like this. So that would change the formulations a little. I was wondering if you could talk to us about those sorts of ideas. Yeah, I mean, by coincidence, of course, the you know the, the notion of counterfactual breadth, um, that is, if you like, another dimension to the temporal depth, um, mm -hmm. came from a Neil Seth, and Neil Seth has an office next to Andy at Sussex. That's so, right. So, um, uh, you know, Andy Clark being the author of the Extended Mind and and and, and Designer Environment. Uh, so I think there's a lot, uh, you know. They they clearly have their own views of things, but there's also a lot of synergy between between the two. You know, uh, Anil focusing more recently on embodiment and being a beast machine, where, whereas um, Andy's I think is, you know generalizes the importance of situatedness and and embodiment. Um, um, so um, the, the, so I think there's a very uh, a very close connection between those perspectives, and you can trace the legacy of these ideas. I'm sure you have done, you know, from the, you know the historical writings that um, have, have emerged in terms of people like Andy Clark and, and Neil Seth and, and and the like. In terms of the you know um, the um, the counterfactual breadth being divorced from the sensorium. I think that must be right in this, because there's no full divorces if you allow for this vicarious sparse connectivity that just is the, uh, the, the message passing or the belief updating in a hierarchical architecture we're talking about. But um, I think sort of just commonsensically, yes, if you are planning what to do and you're planning in the future, you're planning a rollout, uh, a trajectory, a path into the future, clearly there are no... Um, observable outcomes from the future so it is purely counterfactual and um, as soon as you entertain more than one path into the future you don't have to i mean thermostat doesn't you know it, it just considers one little tiny trajectory into the future but if if we're now um you know in the planning as inference kind of um um active inference or predictive processing then then you're going to have more than one path you're going to evaluate that and of course the the number of paths that you evaluate is exactly the counterfactual depth that Anil um, was referring to, and it also it introduces interesting semantics which philosophers um, like, which of course once you've got more um, more than one path to select from, you induce the problem of selection. Now, as a mathematician, that's fine. That's based on model selection. I just I just select the one with the greatest evidence or the, the least expected free energy. Um, but of course, if you're a philosopher, you, you've now got the notion of free will because you've got the act of selecting amongst the counterfactuals uh, or not free will, depending upon uh, if it's prescribed by... The uh, policy. Yeah. 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 So... Uh, yeah, I, I think um, yeah, I think yes, it has to be imaginal in the sense that it is imagining a future, uh, and you can indeed articulate that under simulation theory, for example. Um, um, uh, and in that sense, it is divorced from the sens uh, from, from the sensory input, but of course, it is underwritten by you, 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 by the sensory input because your your paths do depend upon where am I at the moment, and that is conditioned upon sense making. Um, so, yes. And sorry, just to um, then make the link to 
if you think about Levin's collective cognition work. All right, so yeah. And yes. the mark of blankets, and and then I listened to a really fascinating Chris Fields with you uh, on sac, uh, sac, uh, philosophy babble, I think it was, where we spoke about um, that boundary condition, the information processing. At, on the boundary and then the distinction between two mark of blankets and how to unpack that when are they one mark of blanket and when do you have to compute them as separate entities and uh, with separate agency yeah I, you're bringing in a whole other uh, fascinating world here <laughs> that, um, you know people like mike levin chris fields uh mm -hmm. i um and you know, they would talk about things like distributed cognition and basal cognition mm -hmm. and ascribing the more elemental kind of active influence I was describing, ascribing them mm -hmm. to sort of even molecules or at least macromolecules and cells, mm -hmm. and, and asking questions about the emergence of multicellular organizations and the intracellular signaling. And would this be described as, uh, well, it certainly would and could be described as active inference. And of course, once you do that, you can use the, the teleology that you get from cognition and hence mm -hmm. distribution. Mission. Um, so I, I very much encourage that and um, and encourage um, Chris Fields in his mantra that you know in reality there should be no difference between um, physics and psychology um, and biology and philosophy. They're all the same thing, and mm -hmm. we should all be using the same words quite merrily and in an interchangeable way. And I, I would fully subscribe to that. Um, the uh, just one interesting example of that, which um, I I always like to reiterate, um, is you know once you understand that you, you or once you allow yourself to um, with, with 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 gay abandon use cognitive terms to describe the behaviour of cells, either maintaining or destroying their Markov blankets, you can now, as Mike does and has done, uh, talk about cancer as a delusion. You know, a, a false inference, and you can start to sort of think, you know, think in a way which I think is quite an expressive and interesting way to think about you know physical phenomena at the cellular or the uh, at the molecular level in terms of this kind of um, 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 you know not ascribing intentions to to, to cancer, but there's certainly the same kind of collective or um, situated cognition that societies of people of things like you and me uh you know, might might express mm -hmm. it all the two final points here uh, of course you know there isn't just one mark of blanket there are probably no, not an infinite number but certainly almost uncountable because of all the common torics so any sparsely coupled system you can draw mark of blankets everywhere um and of course you can have markup blankets of markup blankets so you really usually have to identify the markup blanket of interest and that defines you as a psychologist or a molecular biologist or a sociologist or an ethologist or whatever uh that just you know that's your scale of markup blanket and that kind of markup blanket is what you like to uh to talk about um so you know the, as we intimated before just having a deep generative model or hierarchical generative model means there are multiple markov blankets in the brain and i mentioned that because chris more recently has um, coming back to, to, to david's question he's more recently um, tr um uh, tried to understand what you know the locus of sentience in terms of consciousness as um in terms of an inner screen um, and or, and the notion of a, an irreducible Markov blanket. So there may be one Markov blanket right in the middle of our brains in the pineal gland that cannot, because of its lack of sparsity, uh, contain any more Markov blankets within it. And that has some special characteristics that uh, Chris argues might might uh, you know might be uh, associated with consciousness. Mm. You introduce the fields there in terms of um, his take on Markov blankets. Uh, his take is um, beautiful and abstract um, uh, and comes from quantum information theory, where effectively he replaces the Markov blanket with a holographic screen. And I think that, you know, that's, that's what you were, you were referring to, which is a wonderful uh, move, uh, sometimes a little bit beyond me because I've forgotten all my quantum physics, but it is, it is an interesting move to make, um, to think about the relationship between um, communication and exchange between the internal and the external bulk um, via a holographic screen because the holographic principle tells you that all the stuff on the inside 
all the information on the inside bulk has to be on the surface, on the blanket, on the holographic screen, which basically means that everything I need to know or that is knowable about you is on your Markov blanket. It's just how we exchange. And that means I will never quite know what's going on inside your head and can never know by definition. So that has some interesting uh, consequence, I think. For, for, it's for, it's uh, just delightful, isn't it? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Harris at Neo Fitu next, and then Dave. I see you put a number of comments in, Dave. So we'll then go to you after after Harris. So Harris, if you could summarise the question you put in chat, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, great talk and really insightful answers. Uh, thank you. Uh, here is my question: uh, Scribes in ancient times were tasked with copying text by hand. And it was a rather laborious and time-consuming uh, process. Uh, those scribes aimed to minimize the effort expended in the copying process, much like physical and biological systems. Uh, they strove to achieve the most efficient and accurate reproduction of the original text while su minimizing surprise by reducing the likelihood of introducing errors. Uh, they developed techniques uh, such as using templates, employing standardized formats, and even utilizing mnemonic, mnemonic devices uh, to improve efficiency and accuracy. So Professor Friston, considering the parallels between the least action principle in physics and the free energy principle in cognitive science, is it safe to utilize these uh, principles to inform our understanding of human cognitive processes in activities that required uh, this extra meticulous precision and optimization, such as the man manuscript copying work of those scribes. Yes, I, I, I think, uh, well, is it safe to apply it? Um, that's a loaded question, but a very nice question. I, I think, yes, I, I think it would be perfectly viable to apl apply that. And I think it's very good of you to actually introduce the notion of a, you know, a principle of least action uh, because that's just what the free energy principle is. It's nothing more than a principle of least action. So you can articulate it using a pathological formulation, literally as the um, understanding both action and perception as evincing or just pursuing paths of least action, which is, as you're intimating, um, paths of maximum efficiency, paths of minimum error, paths of maximum replic uh, replicability, pa paths of maximum uh, as and sustainable um, um, and resilient uh, reliability. Um, that that you know, if you, if if something was able to um, persist and exist on its own attractor, its own um, in its own preferred states, very very precisely, you you would get exactly the behaviour of your scribes. So I imagine they had a very comfortable and relaxed life with this very, very specific model of what they do, and they did it perfectly. Um, and, you know, uh, and in that sense, they, I think, would be an example of something that would easily be described in terms of a path of least action. Um, and as such, um, you would be fair to apply the free energy principle to, you know, to, to that to, to that kind of behavior I get I guess what you'd have to ask though um is well if we are just trying to minimize prediction errors you know would you would your scribes ever become creative would they become poets would they start to uh, experiment with different artistic scrolls um uh, and then one gets into the interesting questions well where does that kind of information seeking come from? And then, of course, the answer from the point of view of the free energy principle, it's only when you get big enough that you now have the opportunity to think about the consequences of your action. And then that curiosity, that epistemic affordance, that expected information gain starts to come into play. So, again, you might think that scribes that committed their entire lives just to copying manuscripts were um, were were um, uh, you know were not um, probably got quite bored. I assume they had quite big brains, so so they probably wanted to to automate that and and do something that sated their curiosity. Uh, because you can get a machine to do that, and because the machine doesn't plan in the, it's not it doesn't have that epistemic explorative um, capacity that, that that a machine does or uh, you know. Uh, um, 
um, a calculator would, and I mean calculator in in the original sense of you know um, people actually doing calculations in the beginning of the industrial revolution. So a very interesting question. Is that is that what you meant? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Great answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. After David, we'll then go to Arand Van Kampen and then Richard Barry. So David, do you want to go next? Dave Douglas, me? Me? Yep. Great, thanks. Okay, welcome, Carl. Oh, okay. I've been in many of your presentations at Active Inference Institute. Now, today you've mentioned the richness of the Markov blanket concept in various contexts. Now, in a paper of yours from a few years ago, I'm sorry, I forget the title, you mention that the blanket around an informational regime within uh, a living tissue, particularly neurological tissue, might or might not coincide with cell membranes or tissue boundaries. Do you have any further thoughts you can share with us about that? There are some people on, on this side of the pond who would be very pleased to um, reflect on your thinking about how one differentiates um, a psychological process from the people in which that process embeds itself or a, a meme from the various uh, brain tissues that the meme uh, embeds itself. Uh, Chris, yes, we, we're updating the uh, work of Do Professor Gordon Pask, who I think addressed some of these same questions in a very concise or incisive way, and I think simplifies things by mul simplifies the work to be done by slightly multiplying the number of conceptual tools to be used. Can can you expand upon that last last sentence? Oh for, well, for those people better who don't I should know. just I should repeat the 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 the, the gist. Um, the when we talk the the there's traditionally go, going back to Bertolanffy, there are there's been a lot of many many times people have pointed out that a lower or in your terms a faster level of activity may be controlled or steered or motivated by a higher level or a slower level of control. So you have this, this asymmetric mutual influence and control and communication duality, pairing. Okay. Now, usually the assumption has been that there's a single way to perform that kind of analysis. In fact, that it's just a simple, if you have multiple levels, that if you have two more than two levels to deal with, there is necessarily a strong or weak ordering among levels of control, okay? There's the word of God, there's the traditions of men, there's your, physio there's the, your work as a farmer, and there's your physiological needs, and there's a strict hierarchy, one, A controls B controls C controls D, and that that individuation occurs in one and only one way. It's just control. Control is control. Presupposition is presupposition. Now, Gordon Pask, working in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, along with some, some of our colleagues still around, still active in cybernetics, discovered that, well, in the realm of teaching, of, of teaching and learning, it's much simpler to say, no, wait a minute, don't try to conflate all control relations into a single kind. There are, after all, psychological processes, and there are mechanical or physiological processes. The physiological processes are spatiotemporally distinguished. Mecha machines, you can look at the boundaries. They have a boundary in, uh, in space. They have origins in time. But the, phys the and the psychological processes also have boundedness, but it's not that same kind of boundedness. Where is Beethoven's symphony? I want to know where the exactly the spatiotemporal boundaries of that are. It's, it's a category error. So Pask just says, look, there's individuation into minds, psychological entities, memes, and there's also individuation into spatiotemporally bounded things, regions. It 
is the case that mental entities control and listen to other mental entities. It's the case in, um, oh, say, the organization of a thunderstorm, perhaps, or, or uh, you know, dirty water is a better example, turbulent, dirty water, that there's, there's control of large, uh, small, the, the possibilities of small entities by large entities, but the large entities are also dragged around by the small entities. So you have that control. And it also also the case, more importantly, perhaps, that sometimes a mental entity, say a meme in the, in the classic sense, controls the, 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 um, the web browsing activities of a number of individuals. And at that point, the psychologically differentiated individuals acting among themselves control and are influenced by physical entities. The fact that your electricity went out today it knocks out an entire class of mechanical entities. The computers aren't working. And I know that in, in one of your papers explaining the physiology of uh, predictive processing and active inference, you, at the end of one of the sections, in about one sentence, say, it's not clear that the boundaries of the that the functional processes always coincide with the boundaries between cells or between tissues. That's the point where my ears stuck out and I said, I remember Gordon Pask telling me about that in 1975. Here's Carl Frist, and please tell us more about that. Is there more than one kind of individuation, either instrumentally in, sense, in the sense that, oh, I feel like dividing the world up in this way, or I can divide it up that way, or I can divide it up both ways and then see how they fit together, or maybe cells and memes and songs and cultures and legal traditions and biological species individuate themselves in various ways. Dave, I think, yeah. I think you posed the question great. Uh, Carl, do you, do you want to respond? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, there's a lot to respond to. That was illuminating. I, I didn't know about that work, but it all sounds um, very sensible from my point of view uh, and the kind of work that I should know about. Um, so in brief, uh, you know, the way that you were talking about the separation of temporal scales and the circular causality, I understand that from um, the work of, say, Herman Haken and, and you know, in, in terms of, you know, the... the the, the slaving principle and your know, top-down and bottom-up causation, and, that, and, and I think that 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 is that that view is nicely evinced with the recursive message passing in these deep generative models. Uh, it also makes entire sense that um, you should be able to um, apply things like the pre free energy principle to different kinds of things, whether they are memes or communication or um, um, the products of um, um uh, uh, products of culture for example right down to um amoeba and single cells that have spatial temporal boundaries absolutely you know the free energy principle is just a principle which i mean by which i mean it is a method it's a tool that you can apply it to um could you apply it to um things with you know spatial temporal uh, boundaries like a cell absolutely and people do that uh, could you apply it to something more abstract um, such as the passing of memes on, on the web, for example. Absolutely, people have done that. Um, and I think that, you know, the Markov blanket there is not really quite so well-defined spatial temporal. It's more as you would define it in a, you know, if you're a systems theorist, it would just be input-output uh, relationships. So, you know, in terms of systems theory, the Markov blanket's nothing more than defining the system in terms of its inputs and outputs. So you'd have to sort of label the inputs and outputs on, on you know, um, um, on your Bluetooth or your Ethernet uh, in a social web, and that and that would be the, the you know the way of defining the mark the the, the conditional sorry, the sparse connectivity that defines the Markov blanket, um, and then uh, it wouldn't quite define Beethoven's symphonies, but but it it would allow you to 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 then talk about the Markov blankets of this community or this social group, and the exchange of ideas provided they you know they can be classified or uh, quantified in some formal way as message passing between Markov blankets and, you know, uh, and you should be able to apply the free energy principle. Uh, I say it's been done. It's been done in a very elemental way um, by looking at um, 
population and voting dynamics by simulating agents passing messages on the web, but in a very simple way, in proportion or in a way that the, each agent believes in the veracity of another person, agent's belief, depending on how similar that agent is to itself. Um, and then you get some really interesting polarization dynamics through this multi-agent active inference that I think you could describe in terms of pass, you know, passing memes uh, and the collective co commitment to a meme, I think would, would start to speak to this more abstract mindful kind of application that, that, that you were intimating. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'd like to squeeze in the last two questions. So, Arend, do you want to go next? And then we'll finish off with Richard. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Friston. Really great to be here and uh, see you live. <laughs> I, I watched you on with uh, Lex Friedman a while ago. Huh? Um, my question would be, uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Fritjof Capra, who I have in a picture I'm going to see here. And, and he says in 1991, so my question is, uh, would you agree with the observation of Fritz of Capra that global disorder, social entropy, is caused by a crisis of perception? Um, I think I will have to go away and think about that. Um, uh, it speaks very much, doesn't it, to the earlier question about, you know, could one use... Um, the free energy principle and related uh, formulations to talk about um, 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 societal uh, disorder uh, in terms of communication and the way that we perceive others. Um, I, I, I think it would be trivial of me to try and give you, uh, you know, a clever or informed answer without thinking about this. It, it does, uh, I mean, one useful thing uh, I think that you know, could be um, brought to the table here is that the, the free energy principle is dual to James's maximum entropy principle, which, of course, is, you know, could be cast as what are the constraints on a particular kind of disorder. But the twist um, from the point of view of the free energy principle is that the entropy that James was talking about was the entropy of the measurement. It was the observation. And I think read as a perception, I think there's a deep connection now between James's maximum entropy principle, which you know, for him is how does a how does a physicist perceive by doing her measurements, um, and you know, the, the, almost paradoxically saying that the best the best kind of perception is maximizing the entropy of the measurement representation, uh, which for for um, the free energy principle would be the um, the variance of that. Um, Q distribution of the external states that are, be, that, are, that are being measured. So I think there is some deep connection between perception as measurement and, the, and, and observation and um, the natural tendency of things to minimize their thermodynamic free energy and maximize their representational entropy. Uh, what that means for the entropy and the disorder of the, th of the thing in and of themselves, I'll have to think about. Yes, I was just referring to the work of uh, Kenneth Bailey, uh, Social Entropy Theory, uh, which I've been uh, looking at. And that's why the perception, the observation, the interpretation of reality differs, right? So that is the, I think, uh, the, the cause of many, many misinterpretation and many misactions at this time causing this social entropy. Yes, yeah. We don't have time, but, you know, it would be... It would be really nice to talk about sort of um, some of the pathologies of perception from the point of view of applying the free energy principle to psychiatric conditions like hallucinations and delusions, sensory attenuation, and what that would look like in terms of communities talking to each other, making inferences about each other. Uh, some really fascinating, uh, fascinating issues there. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'll, if you want to ask your. <laughs> Do the last question and if everybody hasn't seen it there's a question to us all collectively from paul pangara but we we, we won't have time to cover that so richard you want to go ahead uh thank you thank you professor F fascinating talk i'll try and um use parsimony and and m minimize my uh use of of free energies um so um we make decisions as a society collectively um we draw inference 
from the world and information we are provided, um, sometimes very inaccurately. Um, and I'll go back to the Butler inquiry and the decision um, to go to war on incorrect inference around weapons of mass destruction. We see it daily in the courtrooms where um, 12 good citizens will be asked to draw inference from um, evidence that they perceive has been presented to them and make some, some pretty high risk decisions um, around individuals. And of course, we get it wrong. And the post office inquiry is, is a really, really good example of collectively getting it wrong. So, so my question, really, really straightforward. Um, is there a way we can manage um, what you've described in a, a more consistent way and draw inference, sorry, have more confidence in the way we draw inference um, from, from the world? Um, I think the short answer um, you know, would be um, you're, you're not going to find a cure, but you can certainly articulate the problem that would reveal strategies to cure. And, I, you know, and I'm using the word cure, presuming, of course, you don't want to have this, um, this, this extremely unstable and unpleasant situation where you just don't know where to turn for, for reliable information. So we, everybody has lost epistemic trust in everybody else with fake news and the like. And I've also heard the argument, just to generalise that um, in terms of, you know, young people nowadays having so much access to different channels of information on social media and elsewhere that's a, an incredible burden on their mental health and i think that would be usefully understood um in the same spirit of, you know you, you don't know which um you and i don't know which news channel to trust if we you know happen to cross american news channels you know, it's, it's very difficult to know you know is is this reliable information or not from the point of view of the free energy principle um, and applying it to um, understand what has gone wrong and how it can be remedied. Um, it's very, very simple. That you know, if you if the imperatives for a sustainable maintenance of your Mankoff blankets and the implicit attracting set rests upon minimizing surprise, and the expected surprise that underwrites your planning is literally uncertainty or entropy. The expected self invasion is the entropy. What that means is we are all in the game of choosing those actions that minimise uncertainty. And coming back to what we were talking about before about the counterfactual, we have to choose between different actions. And if we have many, many more actions available, then necessarily there's going to be an entropy or uncertainty over what we're going to do. And that can be incredibly, and that has been associated with angst. So if I if I represent that and I have that hypothesis, what state of mind am I in? And I now don't know what to do next. That is anxiety. And that has direct physiological um, and neuroendocrine uh, consequences. So if that is true, what that means is if I've got too many choices and I cannot trust which which uh, what actions to make, sorry, I cannot trust um um, the differential reliability of various sources of information because of this overconnectivity um, that necessarily distributes the probability mass over all the things I could do that necessarily increases my anxiety. So you know, you're looking at the the way that we select sources of information for building our world models and our beliefs as a problem of actively selecting the right kind of data place you know whether this is just in eye movements you know from moment to moment or whether it's actually subscribing to a particular news channel or social group making that that is an action and it's an action exactly in the service of trying to uh, maximize the expected information gain that depends upon the quality or the precision of the information if that job is made almost impossible because there are so many people shouting at me as an adolescent um um the, you, I, you, you can see immediately how one this would lead to a, a pernicious and irreducible uncertainty about how to act and select the right um, the right sources of information or points of reference or role models um, that will itself then produce um, a, you know, a, 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 a self model 
that is imbued with anxiety and angst and just knowing not not knowing what to do next so that was the kind of pathology i was talking about right at the beginning when i was talking about over connectivity uh, if you just if it's just your teacher and your mother and your father and your your priest depending upon your your culture and you in, imbue them with an epistemic trust then this issue goes away but that does require a very sparse much more familiar communal kind of uh, interaction and belief sharing and, and evidence accumulation is that is that the sort of um yeah we didn't get as far as talking about juries and the legal systems yep. use of, of influence that's uh, itself an interesting issue yeah, yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's one to to sort of work through um, and, and take forward. So really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then I think uh, we are done, Jonathan. We um, are. We are done. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Carl. Brilliant. Yeah. We brought the ship in almost to time. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I think, Carl, you heard how many people were referencing you from different uh, for uh, around the place so you're certainly leaving an impression thank you so much uh, could not ask for more thank you and um, uh, please keep in touch thank you all and wonderful discussions thank you so much yes thank you everyone for the questions and, and just for listening and participating thank you good night thank you thanks carl thanks all my microphones are off but i'm sure the houses are rippling with applause <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Margaret.